Hi, I'm Hilary. This is session 10 of the New Testament Chrome blog. It's just a reminder that the Chrome blog is simply my own study journey and a kind of record of what stands out to me. It's certainly not meant to be a commentary, let alone a complete one. And it's also not meant to tell you what you should believe. It's your own journey and Holy Spirit is going to highlight different things for you to be mulling on. We are deep in John's iconic, poetic, beautiful opening statement, which by the looks of it is going to take us several sessions, but it's well worth it. We considered the mirroring of Genesis 1 and John 1 at the end of the last session, so I want to start by taking those themes one at a time. The beginning, understood as God already existing, is now expanded to introduce the word. So God spoke, understood as an action of God, now explained as something more, a he, a someone who was both with God and was God. Creating, it's understood that God is the creator, that the spirit of God was part of that action, but now we see he was not only there, but he is integral to how it all happened. And the light perhaps previously limited to the literal light of the physical sun, John adds this spiritual picture of light, the light. And I'm starting to see that these verses about the light may be another way of explaining verses one to three, or another angle that adds some understanding. But as we read on, what I noticed is it's more like the passage goes back and forward, building up like waves. In him was life, draws back to all things came into being through him. But then add something more, a momentum. His life was the light, a light that shines in the darkness. Drawing us back to Genesis 1, once again, darkness was over the surface of the deep. Then God said, let there be light. It's like John is building on physical realities with those spiritual ones, something we often find mind-boggling. Physical darkness mirrored with spiritual darkness, both interrupted by light. As Isaiah prophesied in chapter 9 and 49 of his book, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light, a light of the nations. But he is not a new light. Micah chapter 5 says that he is from the days of eternity, or as Jesus puts it, recorded in John 8, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Okay, let's read on. We're still in John 1 and we're in verse 6. There came a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. There are prophecies about John the Baptist, um, which we are going to save for later. But I'm remembering that the author, John, has a purpose for releasing this message at this time. So is there some setting the record straight with people who are still arguing that John the Baptist was the Messiah or is the light? Verse 9's true light enlightening man is the wave that's pulling us back into verse 4's he is the life that is the light of men. In the beginning of verse 10 he was in the world and the world was made through him pulls us even further back, building that momentum to take us deeper and further than the last wave. An interesting cross-reference here is Isaiah 60. The context of the prophecy is darkness and light. And like John, he is correlating the physical with the spiritual. This context starts back in chapter 57, that humans hope for light, but behold darkness. So we stumble at midday as in the twilight. The light needed is described as justice and salvation, and the solutions is someone who put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. Continuing to use the metaphor of the physical sun, 
the Son of God will rise. So when we come to verse 19 in Isaiah's passage, why do we switch to interpret this as a literal sun and moon? No longer will you have the sun for light by day, nor for brightness will the moon give you light, but you will have the Lord as an everlasting light. Is it possible that this passage in Isaiah that says our mourning will be over is actually speaking of the mourning for the light and not the end of the world? The word mourning here comes from the word for lament, to long for something that is missing. The context was that they were hoping, a word that is about waiting and looking eagerly for something. That he is the light that gave us life and the only true light that can give us life. Those who choose that light enter a spiritual reality that is far greater than the physical one. So John has been building momentum with these waves towards releasing these powerful words. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Whew, and that gives us a lot to mull over until next session. I'm going to see you then.